Don't let these shallow little waves take you away. It's not an impossible thing. Son, behave. Me and your mother, now they are so afraid. Just be brave. We didn't raise you to be what you became. Don't spill your faith. Just come back to my home. Still love you, just be brave. It just hurts us to be brave. I'm going to stop that right now. I, I want to thank Logan, Logan Bruce for giving me. I hear your volume. How's that? <laughs> That's better. Uh -huh. Hey, everybody. I want to thank Logan Bruce for giving me the you know permission to start out the show with, with his music, uh, Shallow Waves. It's a very, very touching song about a father speaking to his son who is struggling with addiction. And uh, uh, as, as I progress with my broadcasting abilities, I'm, I'm basically a one-man show here, and I want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, I, I will be able to implement, implement music better, but at this time, this, this is what, we're, what I'm working with. And I want to welcome everyone to the Survivor Series. The Survivor Series is an original product of nomoreheroin.org. And we're all about giving hope, smashing the stigma of addiction, education, and awareness. And giving people, again, giving people hope out there. And tonight, this episode of the Survivor Series is dedicated to the family. The families that have struggled with their loved ones in addiction and we're going to give them tips on how to to help them, how how to how the addicts can help themselves through through this process. And this evening, we have an amazing guest, Laura Lee Rosano, from uh, Vancouver Island in in Canada. Uh, thank you, Laura Lee, for being here. What you, you being here gives credence and credibility to what I'm trying to do with my series, with my platform, you know, with education and awareness and your, your wealth of experience. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, you, you, you're an author of an amazing trilogy. You, you're an author of a children's book as well. You're also a, a professional that, that works with, with families and addicts as well in, in, in the treatment setting. But before you were you were you 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 got to that point, you were a young person struggling with addiction and alcoholism as well. Is that not right? Absolutely. Yeah. Can can you can you can you take us down memory lane and tell us what it was like for you in, in your addiction and your alcoholism and where you were? Uh, I, I can. Hinky, just before I go, um, is there any way to share this with my page? I mentioned to the followers on my page. Uh, I don't know if you have anyone else helping you with this that I'd share it with them, and I wasn't able to do that. If we can't, that's fine. I can share it with um, them later share, on. Can you, can you share it from your phone to you to your group? I can't currently share it because I'm. Let me let me there. let me see if I can and. Um, oh. Just, just turn the volume down. <laughs> yep, we're gonna do that right now. Okay. Thank you guys for being here. Um, we we want to please share this out, guys. Try to try to try to hit the groups. Try to your pages, whatnot. If if you are someone that has addiction, alcoholism running rampant through your family, you have questions for Laura Lee? Please post them in the comment I, comments. I will be uh, posting them up on on the screen as we go. And uh, hi Terry, how are you? Hi Bobby Stacks, my dude. Uh, Lori Palmer Schmidt, hello. Uh, David has shared it for you, Laura Lee. Thank you, David. Oh, perfect. Hi Brittany. Okay. Hi Bob. Hi Autumn. Awesome. How are you? Hi Amy Baker. It's good to see everybody in here. 
Yeah, this, can can you can you do you, you know as well as a treatment professional and an author, you are your person in long term recovery. You have twenty one years of sobriety. How did that happen? How did that happen? How hell if I know. And so I think this is what's really important for every single person listening. It happened. I didn't do it alone. I did it with a lot of help. And it's really important to know that um, you know anyone listening can do this too. As I share a bit of my story, you're probably going to go, oh, my God, did she really do that? How could that be? That person you see sitting here, me, it doesn't even equal the story I'm about to share with you. So and why I share it is not to beat myself with it or shame myself. I share it to sh to sh to let you know that regardless of what you've done and right. the people you've hurt, it's never too late and you can recover. And I really believe before we start this, that God gives his strongest warriors his toughest battles. And so there's a reason you've been given this. If you can find the other side, we need you. So listen, you can do this. And uh, and this is an important show. So first of all, Hagee, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you are reaching all over North America. I have a very large following that are curious and courageous and willing to learn as uh, as your audience is itself. I'm hoping the people that are watching with us right now will throw in questions and comments. I am gonna ask everyone watching, if you're in recovery, please step up and tell family what it is you think they need to know uh, and how they can help their addicted loved one. Because as someone who's worked in the field for a very long time, and as someone who's an addict, I know the people we hit up first are our family. Uh, so during this show, I'm hoping that we can come out of it stronger and more educated. So, so thank you. So me, uh, let's see. Uh, I have two siblings and, and uh, I grew up in an alcoholic home. Not all of us do, um, but certainly a large portion of us do. I never viewed alcohol as a problem for a very long time. Um, as a matter of fact, my dad, when he drank, he was a happy drunk. He was he was kind of fun guy to hang out with. It's when he was sober that he was miserable and you had to really watch out. That's where I learned how to walk on eggshells. That's where, like many of us do, um, I learned what relationships look like. Um, and I took all those skills I learned in that growing up home with me into my adult life. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, and um, I'm a hungry, emotionally needy teen. I'm emotionally starving. And I get into relationships, and I don't get into relationships. I take hostages. Because how oh, I, I understand relationships work is if you love me, you will think like me. You will agree with me. You will believe the things I do and you will do the things I want you to do. And if you don't do that, you don't love me, right? Um, for me, love was a power struggle. It was it was a constant up and down and, uh, and it was chaotic and dramatic and intense. And, uh, and then I, and then I found drugs, right? And then I, and then I found you know, and then I did my, I, I had my first toke, took my first drink. Um, and all of a sudden I went from this really kind of messed up, insecure, needy chick to someone who's skin fit and I could conquer the world. And so what drugs and alcohol did for me is they allowed me to not be me for a very short period of time. And that freedom for me was so intoxicating. I built a lifestyle around it. And uh, just not to be me for that short period of time. And if you have ever struggled with addiction, you will understand what I mean. The noise that goes on in our head is loud. It creates stress and anxiety and insecurities and shame. And all of a sudden, when that's not there, you know what? That's pretty, that, that was pretty intoxicating. So I built a lifestyle around it. And for a long time, it was fun. And, um, you know, and no addict, first of all, nobody picking up drinking and drugging. Hey, we're just all trying to drink like everyone else. We're just all trying to, you know, use drugs like everyone else. And none of us know going into this thing that our brains are vulnerable. So, um, you know, what happened to right. me, right? 
And so what happened to me happened to every single other person struggling with addiction. Uh, my tolerance built and I needed more and more and more to do the same thing. And as my tolerance built, uh, I started having consequences and I started hurting people. And, um, and that was really shitty. I, I hated hurting the people I loved. I, I, don't, I don't think any of us want to hurt the people we love. No. Um, and, and if you're not an addict, it's going to be impossible for you to understand that. Because my family asked me a million times, would you please just quit? Right? Yeah, we, we talked about this the other day. You know, we're, we're, we, we know we want to quit, but our, but our brain is telling us, Get high or I'm going to die. Get high or I'm going to die. Right, right. Does that help? Yeah, well, by the end it was. as You know, like, there's all these stages you go through. As, as you know, when you first start using and you're young and it's fun and there's not a lot of consequences. You know what? You're hanging out with your buddies, closing down the bars. Um, you know, it, it's just a great time. You laugh louder. You dance nicer. You're prettier. You drive better. You do everything better, right? You know, at least you think you do. Um, and, and so it's a lot of fun at first. Uh, but by, by the time it's not fun anymore uh, and you want to stop, you can't. And that's when things start really uh, getting difficult. And so I'll give you a snapshot. Uh, I worked in the bar. Hey, for all of us folks that work in hospitality, it's a great place to party. If you sure. ever want a job where you can party, that was it. And so I, I worked in the bar and I had a good reason to drink, you know, like I had to get in the mood to go serve my customers. And, um, and so my little girl knew I was going to go out and get loaded before I did. So I'd be standing in the bathroom, having a glass of wine, putting on my makeup and she'd be pulling on my skirt, you know, cause I'm going to work. She'd be pulling on my skirt and she's about five years old and she's begging me, mommy, please don't go out. And I'm looking at her and I'm getting down on my knees and I'm saying, don't worry, honey. I like, I'm coming right home. I, I'm coming home after work, you know, and I pinky swear with her and I give her a kiss and I tell her not to be silly. Mommy's coming home. And here's the thing about this. Mommy was coming home. At that moment, I looked my little girl in the eyes. I wasn't lying, but I didn't know that when I took that drink and drug, I was incapable of predicting what would happen afterwards, right? At the moment, I meant I was coming home. And I'll never forget the shame of two days later coming home and looking her in the eyes. And I like I, I didn't make it home after work and I didn't make it home after work many, many, many times. Mm. And I wish that would have been enough. I wish that would have been enough. Breaking my daughter's heart was not enough to get me sober, you know. So people say, well, Jesus, you know, if you love them, can't you stop? Are you kidding me? If I could have stopped, I would have. I would never, ever want to break my child's heart. Something's happening in our brains that we can't see. Like, if you love someone with addiction, you can see them falling down. You can see them taking money. You can see they're wasted, but you can't see what's going on in their in their head and in their brains. And there's a lot of chemical interference at play when, when someone is active addiction. They're chemistry is changed and they aren't coming from the front part of their brain that frontal region that um, speaks about common sense and reasoning and has impulse control and the ability to think strings through addiction reroutes through the old brain that reptilian part where as we were talking about it shouts get dope or die and so if someone pushed your head under water and they held it there would you be thinking about trying to come up with a very good answer about reasoning about why they should remove their hand? You would not. You'd be flailing and you would do anything to get their hand off. And it's it's like that when you're an addict. Um, so unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't stop then. Instead, I kept going. Um, I lost my job. I lost my home. I lost my marriage. I lost my children. Um, I stole from everyone who loved me. I broke laws. Uh, I, I can't think of too many things I didn't do. Um, some par scary people were after me. And at the end of it all, I was underneath some rent cement ramp on the streets thinking about how can I kill myself? That's where my best thinking took me under a cement ramp that where I didn't want to live anymore. And I did, I didn't want to live and I, 
was too scared to die and I was so, so caught. And I think a lot of your listeners will understand that place. Uh, it's a very desperate, hopeless place. Yes, I, I, I can say that, I, that I've been there a couple of different times and just uh, lucky and blessed to be here. Um, yes. What, what, what was, you know, how, how did you find your way out of that bottom? I didn't. I'll tell you what the people who love me did. And this is why I work with, I love working with families. This is why uh, if I had my way before, hey, Heather, if I had my way before we ever kind of put our eyes on the addicted person, we'd bring their family in and we'd train them up because really it makes a huge difference. Um, so what happened to me is sitting underneath that cement ramp should have been my rock bottom. It should have been the position that I said, oh my God, I can't possibly go any lower. You can't fall off the sidewalk, right? However, what was happening in my mind was ways of planning and scheming and scamming who else could I call to make up my sad story that would give me some money to get me out of my predicament? Now, my parents weren't talking to me. My boyfriend had left me. My kids weren't speaking to me. I owed everyone money. I didn't have a dime. Um, I owed all my dope dealers money. And there were some really, really scary guys look, looking for me. But I did have one door open. So where all the others closed in my world, there was one door open. And that door was my dad had said many years ago, because by now he's sober, he had said, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. But he said, if you ever want help, I'll get you into treatment. Well, I knew treatment had great detox meds. And I figured if I could go into treatment and I could get some detox meds and maybe I could scam some money in there, manipulate some people because all my active addiction life, I had been able to manipulate my surroundings. I could always sell someone a sob story and they would buy it and feel sorry for me. Or I would become so ugly with them, they would just give me money to get rid of me. Hey, Lisa. Um, so I went into treatment with a three day plan. I was going to get some meds. I was going to get some detox meds and I was going to get enough money that I could go off my drug dealers and score more. Of course, I was going to sell it and, you know, make a fortune and not use so much of it this time. And yada, yada, yada. You know the plans, right? I know. Like, I know that. are constantly scheming. <laughs> and boy, parents, spouses, please know that. Um, yeah. So that's what happened. The rest. I am shocked about, I am shocked to tell you, I sit here 21 years clean and sober, working in the field of mental health and addiction, writing books about this. Like I didn't see any of that coming. I was a hopeless, homeless drug addict who was thinking about killing myself. My mm. best thinking was taking me out. And so I went into a place where I got help in spite of not wanting it. I like to tell people I got well in spite of myself. And I did. I got well in spite of myself. This isn't this isn't a me project sitting in front of you. This is a we project. So that's how I'm here today. That's amazing. That's amazing. So with with the work that you do in reaching the, the you know try, trying to help the addicts and help help the families as well, you know what what, what advice can you give? the family members, what, what type, what should their support network look like once, well, or should I say what, what, what type of education should they start looking for when they know that their loved one is using drugs and alcohol or is addicted? Well, there's a couple of things like, um, if I was them, I'd check out an open a or any meeting sit in there and listen to other addicts in recovery, uh, talk about, you know, share their story, share their struggles, share their shame and pain. Um, so Chrissy, I'm so sorry. Wow. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Chrissy. Oh my gosh. Um, it, it, there for the grace of God, go I, I, I really thought I would have, I, I almost did that too. Um, so go sit in those meetings and go meet those addicts in recovery. And then that's not all though. <laughs> that's not all go to your own meeting because here's the thing it doesn't matter what you know and you do need to learn a lot you really do because addiction is a family disease so if you keep thinking that it's up to the addict to make all the changes and it's up to the addict to do all the work 
then I got to tell you, you are part of the problem um, because it's not up to the addict. It's a family disease. It's a family illness. Everyone is affected. Right. You cannot have your heart stepped on. You cannot be stolen from. You cannot have your heart broken. You cannot hold resentments and fears and anxiety and not call yourself affected. Um, mm -hmm. So you know what? So go to your own meetings because here's the deal. As long as the addict has someone that they can manipulate in the family, and that could be grandma, and oftentimes it is. A lot of times it's mom, could be the spouse. Um, but if there's just one person they can manipulate, their chances of becoming well are really, really slim really slim so mm -hmm. if you really want to help get yourself to a meeting first of all and get the support and i'll tell you why you need it Thank here's you. why you're going to need it because when you start saying no like my family did when you start closing the doors to that addicted person at three o'clock in the morning you're going to wake up in panic hardly breathing you're going to be so anxious every time the phone rings your heart's going to jump out of your mouth and you're going to feel so guilty like you're going to think Oh my God, what if they're hungry? What if they're dead? What if the drug dealers are after them? If it's my wife or my husband, who are they sleeping with? What are they doing? My baby's cold and in danger. If it's a daughter of yours, that's scary. Are they being raped? Like these horrible thoughts will go through your head. And if you don't have anyone to talk to or reach out about those thoughts, that what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick up the phone and say, okay, come home. And all of a sudden you're gonna become this revolving door relationship, not because you're really helping anymore, but because you've fallen into the same trap as the addict. The addict continues to use to get relief from their emotions and the enabler or the codependent will end up doing the same thing because it's easier to say yes than it is to say no and hold sure. your boundaries because you're gonna go through a lot of emotional upset when you start. And the other thing is the person, your addicted loved one is going to act up because um, they're used to being rewarded for bad behavior. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, you know what, the drug dealers are after me or someone's going to beat me up or I'm going to get killed. And the emotional extortion is going to go up. And if you don't have a support group to say, oh, my God, my kid just phoned me and he said someone's going to kill him if I don't pay off his drug debt. What should I do? Uh, guess what? You're going to you're going to go in and you're going to enable again to relieve yourself of that anxiety. I, 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 I've got to tell you, four or five times a week, may, maybe maybe more at times, I get messages from parents. Look, they they're trying to save their their loved ones, their child, yeah. their their husband, and and they they want pointers and tips on what do I do? What how do I make them want help? You know, and I know I know what what I say to them, but for someone out there that believes that that they can get their loved one clean and sober to stay, what would what would you say to them? I would say to them, you know how hard it is to get to a meeting? Have you gone to one? No. Nope. Okay. So what gets in your way? Well, I don't want to go. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. I don't think I have a problem. I'd tell them all those things are exactly what their addicted person would say. So if they want to help get that person well, they need to be the shining example. They need to lead the way. Families that are in recovery and are educated and in recovery too, their their person, their their addicted person has a far greater chance of getting clean and sober than families that aren't. So um, you know what? I'd say it's time to to walk the talk. You know, take your eyes off them, put them on you, learn what you need to do in this. And I'm not saying turn your back on them because I don't. I do believe families are huge influence in the addict's recovery. No families can't make them get well, but they can greatly influence them into becoming well and changing the dynamics in the family is the very first step. And how do we change those dynamics? Well, we stop engaging in power struggles. We stop allowing ourselves to be manipulated. We hit the pause button. We identify in the family who is the go-to person? Who is the person that the addict calls every time they're in trouble and they need help? So who is that person? And then we encourage that person to go to meetings, to get out, to, to get some help. So we start having those conversations, right? Like if you think about your own, Higgy, um, mm -hmm. who did you manipulate in your addiction? Everyone I could. Everyone. I, everyone. Right. 
And I, you know, like you said earlier, I didn't want to, but I didn't know a different way. And with my brain screaming, I needed yeah. to get high. Yeah. I, it was like being trapped underwater and doing anything to get to the surface just so I could breathe, you know? And, 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 and I, I think, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and I always felt that I would make it up to him someday, you know? Oh, I, God, I, we I, tell ourselves that. I'm going to make it up to you. I promise. I promise. I, I'll change. I'm, I'm going to do better, you know? And, and, and we may... We may mean that, but it's so insincere and so just not not the truth at all. If our lips are moving, we're telling a lie. And the scary part is we believe it. And that's why we're so convincing to everyone else. So I know exactly what you mean. I'll, I'll never forget stealing my kids' money. We had been saving up for this trip to Disneyland. We had about 300 bucks. My kids were taking in bottles and my son was doing a paper route and I stole their money. And the whole time in my head, I said, I'm going to pay this back. I'm going to pay this back. Now, for anyone watching, that might seem scary enough and sad enough and bad enough. But what happens next after this, I got to tell you, if you don't reach out and get help right at that point, something even scarier happens. And it happened to me. I don't know if it happened to you, Hickey. God forbid it happens to a lot of us. And that is we reach a stage and it's the last stage where we stop caring we don't care who we hurt we don't care if we live or die we don't we'll walk over broken glass we'll light people on fire we just need to get high and that's when the soul is gone i remember I, yeah I, I, I describe it as being chemically lobotomized devoid of all feelings emotions you know yeah. any, any 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 joy of anything else is totally gone an empty shell gone what a great description i love that description i describe it as the walking dead my body breathes my heart beats but i am gone i whatever was me is not in here and that is so terrifying for families because they still think they're dealing with the same person and um they're not Congratulations, Nicole. seven years three months isn't that amazing uh, and I hope all you guys are putting your stories in and giving comments and letting the families know we're struggling addicts too. Laura Lee, I'd like to read a couple comments to you. Sh Shana Please Lee, do. Shana Lee sh sh I believe I'm spelling or pronouncing that right. She, Shana Lee says, my beginning took six months after I left home. My wife said it was time to leave. She had enough. Six months later, I hit rock bottom, then finally went to rehab. My advice, if you love the addict don't don't enable the addict i'm with my wife and family almost four years sober every day is a blessing not taken for granted congratulations that's a great testimony that's that's awesome one more let's see if i can find it here i think that i, I lost it but well, yeah just to back just to add to what Shanna said is um, that happened to me too. Uh, although my parents had quit enabling me, I still found other people who would, particularly Dave, who if you guys have been following my page, you know he did me a favor when he quit me. And I'm not kidding. Um, he left me. So when he left me, because I couldn't work anymore because I was too, I was loaded all the time. Um, mm -hmm. When he left me, he took the finances with him. So uh, after I was evicted and I had no money anywhere and I was forced to go through that only door left to me, rehab, um, he really saved my life. You know, we're married now, but we had two years of hell. We're both addicts. He was ready to quit. I wasn't. He said, it's me or drugs. I chose drugs. He left. And he had left a million times before. Uh, but this time he didn't come back. I couldn't manipulate him. And for the very first time I met it, I got to tell you, an addict can tell when you mean it. And that's when things start to change. So um, if you love them, mean it. Is, is, there, is, is there a difference between enabling, enabling and codependency or do they coexist? You can be codependent, um, like the people pleasing symptoms. They're they're pretty much they pretty much coexist, uh, but enabling is really tying your well being to someone else. So you're so you're the reason you're enabling isn't really to help the addict. 
it is because um, you don't want to experience those really uncomfortable emotions. So moms often enable with the best intentions of all. Uh, but what really happens is once they say yes, when no is the right answer, they actually stop feeling guilty and get a sense of relief, just like the addicts gets a sense of relief when they score. So people end up doing the same thing. They're very tightly wound, but they're not exactly the same thing. I was, right. I was already, I was already as a child, I was, uh, I, I had learned to be codependent through my relationship with my dad because you see in our house, in any addict's house, um, there's only one person getting their needs met. That's the addict. Everybody exists. Everybody else exists to meet that addict's needs. And so I had already had really good training growing up uh, to prepare me for what I was about to face as a teenager and then as a young woman. And that meant people pleasing um, becoming a chameleon, you know, like, okay, you know, you know, you know, yeah, you know what that really means? It means who the hell am I? I don't know. I don't know who I am because I am whoever you want me to be. So you tell me what you need and who you need me to be. And mm -hmm. that's what I'll be. And we're, I think we're, probably, we're and actors in, in our own fact, story. Right? We are, we are actors and we got it going on all the time. And I remember sitting in, in group therapy and treatment and I hated this counselor. Oh, I hated him. And and always I had the smile on, you know, and, and how are you today, Lordly? Fine. You know, another one, you're fine. He says, no, you're not. You're full of shit. And inside I'm thinking you're an asshole, but I'm not going to say that because I'm fine. And besides, I want the hell out of rehab. So I'm figuring if I just put on the smiley face and everything's fine, I can just get out there and I'll, I'll just say whatever you want me to say. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then I'm just going to go back and do my own thing. Anyhow, this counselor didn't buy any of that. And I'll never forget, he kept poking at me and poking at me and poking at me. He says, you're a big phony. And that pissed me off. <laughs> I, started, I started getting angrier and angrier. And he could see it and he kept poking. And finally, I just stood up from my chair and said, what the fuck do you want me to say? And I just went off on him. And he just sat there and I thought, great, I'm going to get kicked out. And he All took right. a breath and he started clapping. And he said, welcome to treatment. Good to see you, real. And I thought, holy shit you know what, it's actually okay to say my thoughts out loud and people aren't going to run away. They're not going to look at me like, whoa, she's nuts. Um, that was the very first time I actually told someone the truth when I was sober about what I was thinking and feeling. That was the very first time in my life. That's when my recovery started. I, I, I want to I clarify that, that that was Justin Mellor, Mellor, Mellor. Not not Shanna Lee. It's a joint account, so he, he clarified that uh, it, it is Justin. He says, "I love this. My rehab brought family in to understand and help us heal. It really requires family to heal and help when the addict is is ready. The family really went through the hell I put them I put them through. It affects the whole family. Thank yeah. you, Laura Lee. Yeah, yeah, Ab absolutely. You know, um, oh." uh the damage i did to my children the uh, it's unbelievable the damage i did is unbelievable as a matter of fact i'm still seeing it today 21 years later uh we are still coming through the wreckage but the thing is now they know mom's there they know um they can trust me people know they can trust me i don't react in the same way and um but you know we, we all we all do so much damage and and if I would, if someone would have told me 21 years ago, you know what, Laura Lee, when, as you sit underneath that cement ramp and the smell of urine, looking at your paraphernalia mm -hmm. and your yeah. other drugs, if someone would have said, all you have to do to recover is to get real and honest and just share your stuff with people, that's going to be the first step and it's going to change your life. I, I think I probably would have thought, I don't believe that. That's too simple. Like, how can that even? How can that even be? You know? I, I didn't. I didn't believe anybody was was clean and sober in meetings when I first went in. I, I thought you guys are lying. There's no way that you you can you can be clean and sober a, a six months to a year. Everybody needs to get high. Everybody needs to drink. Everybody's doing something on you know on the sly. You know that that Absolutely. was thinking, You know. I am with you. I'd look at these smiling, happy faces. They're joking and laughing. And I'm thinking, what are you on? And I want some, right. you know, 
like, you're too happy. You're too happy, you big phony. Exactly. <laughs> You got to understand by this time, I couldn't go three hours without getting high. I couldn't imagine a whole day, let alone 30 days. Like I saw people getting in meetings or a year or two. It was like absolutely impossible. Um, you know, and, and 21 years later, I'm here to tell you that um, recovery is really simple. All you have to do is follow direction. And that's the hard part. <laughs> right so if, it, if you don't put a substance in your body you can't get high <laughs> you'll have to you won't you won't have no concept well you may have consequences yeah. but it won't from be from using but here's the thing if you can't get high real and what are we all trying to do in active addiction we're trying to avoid reality so yeah. right yeah yeah from whatever it is that we're escaping from so most of us it's just us yeah for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do you encourage, how do you empower the families to walk through that fear, to stand firm in uh, separating themselves from the enabling aspect? How right. do you empower them to walk through that fear? Because they are fear. They're, they're seized up with fear. They're going to get that call, you know? Yeah. What, what, what are they going to do to get the money if I don't give it, give it to them? How do you help them walk through that fear? Well, first of all, we have to recognize I've got fear. And so when I have fear, I need to share that fear. Because if I don't share that fear, that fear becomes paranoia. That fear becomes panic. I give my fear a ton of strength and I go into the worst case scenario. So I need to find, like families need to find, safe, supportive people to share that fear with. I can't take that fear away. You're going to feel that fear. What you're going to find out, though, is if you share that fear, you take the power from it. If you share those worst case scenarios, you take the power from it. If you share with safe, supportive people, they will say, me too, I've been there, I've done that. And do you know what? 90% of what we fear never, ever happens. That's a lot of stuff to That's be right. fearing, and, right. You know, right? 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 So, so, but families don't know that. They don't know that. And right. here's the thing. Families become, they get mental obsession, the same as the addict. So the addict obsesses on the drug. The family obsesses on the addict. So the essential symptoms of addiction, codependency, they're exactly the same. The only difference is the 15%, either the drug of choice or the addict. So I invite you to, you know, you know, here's, if you can find a family program to attend, like at a treatment center, and you take five days out of your life, it will change your life. And I'm not kidding you, it happens that fast. You will not be the same people going into that program as you are coming out. You'll be miles advanced. You'll be two, three years down the road of Al-Anon or other programs because they're gonna throw so much at you in a short time. And not only that, are you gonna learn in theory, you will also learn through participating. And you can't believe me if that hasn't been your experience. So in order to take away your fear, you need to recognize it, you need to accept it, and you need to share it. Um, and those are the three steps to taking that fear, or at least putting it in a healthy fear versus um, an irrational fear. That's right. Now, I, I believe you touched on this earlier, but when the family gets into recovery, would you say that the, that the addict is more more apt to follow suit? Absolutely. First, after when the family gets into recovery, it's going to be really rocky for a little bit. You can expect a couple of months of the addict um, getting worse before they get better, just because they are are absolutely used to being able to manipulate the family. So usually they can manipulate the family with promises and tears, um, but when they're not able to use those, then they start getting into some uglier stuff like, um, you don't love me, I'll never see you again. Fine, I'll kill myself and it's your fault. You know, they start to get pretty ugly. And that's a traumatic, traumatic thing for mm -hmm. moms and spouses and children of addicts to hear because they take that on. Oh my God, what if it's, there's what if so they do? Much, there's so much trauma that both sides absorbs yes. during this time. You know, the family, with, I mean, the people get PTSD from dealing with their addicted loved ones, trying to rescue them from dangerous situations. You know, the, the violence in the home, the stealing of property. And I mean, 
how how do they move past and work through that trauma as well well and it depends trauma is kind of a spectrum thing and you know mm -hmm. um and so, and i and i have to say if you've had trauma in your life i would never ever want to work past that alone you may not be able to do that sort of thing in a support group either um but what i would encourage is before you go take the lid off all that trauma um, that you have a really good solid foundation with safe supportive people so that when you are ready to take that lid off and start letting those memories and stories out uh, they don't trigger you and re-traumatize you so uh, find a counselor um, you know contact go to a support group find a counselor um, get someone that can help you walk through those memories without re-traumatizing yourself because when we love addicts we see a lot of stuff that's really really ugly a lot of the addicts are in blackout and don't even remember it so you may mm -hmm. they may not even remember they've done this stuff like i saw my dad throw fall through glass shower doors i stepped over my dad my kids saw me in horrible horrible circumstances mm -hmm. we have families finding their loved ones od like it just goes on and on and on and so what happens when you're in trauma is you start before your body Thank God our brain is smart. Our, our bodies are amazing things when you start to understand neurobiology and biology. So your body goes into shock and it takes, it doesn't take it in all at once. And this is why I'm saying trauma is something that if you feel you've been traumatized, I wouldn't try to deal with that on your own. I would get some professional help for it. Again, so you don't end up re-traumatizing yourself because there is a way to uh, deal with trauma, but it's very gentle and soft and patient, and it needs professional clinicians mostly to help you with that. Um, that's... Uh... That's, that's so much to take in. The the, the families uh, just go through so 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 much. Um, I had another question I was going to ask you. Uh, okay. Da, 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 da. Well, I, I think I think that's that. That was actually my last my last question. Uh, just d dealing with the man manipulation factors. Um, yeah. what about, what, what about, what about the addict that is trying to break a, what break free of an enabler yeah. or, an, or enabling family? And yeah. what, what, what advice would you give to that person? So, so that's really, really hard because sometimes the, uh, an addict will lots of times an addict will come into treatment or go into meetings and they know they their their life's on the skids they've had this light bulb moment and um they they taken some steps and they're becoming well and and all of a sudden but they're going home to the same family every day and so i'll give you a scenario um if it's if i'm if if i'm the wife of somebody and i and my husband's in meetings talking and he comes home i'm going to say to him honey what did you share in those meetings well and I want to know, right? Or I might want to go with him to those meetings. I might want to hear it. And sometimes he's got stuff he needs to talk about that I shouldn't even be a part of. Um, and the other thing is, if my addict husband gets well and I don't get any support, I'm going to have a lot of I'm going to have a lot of resentment because guess what? Addicts in active recovery do a lot of hurtful things. They come home to their families and they've had the opportunity to have support and to heal, but the family hasn't. Mm -hmm. So they go back into a family dynamic that is angry, resentful perhaps walking on eggshells, um, maybe treating them silent treatment or with kid gloves or getting into yelling matches or wanting to know every move they make. They maybe give them a kiss at the door and smell their breath at the same time. Maybe they're going through their cell phone, looking at all their text messages, they're following, they're, they're, they want to know everywhere they go. And you know, pretty soon we've got an addict that's not going to be doing so well in that family. So you can see what happens and why families need the support too because those feelings don't go away just because someone got clean and sober they're still there and they need to be recognized they need to be addressed they need to be healed and so the family needs to find people that are safe and supportive that have been in their shoes the addict needs to find people that are safe and supportive been in their shoes and both those parties individually of each other need to work on themselves so that when they come back together they can do it in a way that promotes health and not dysfunction. Yes, yes. It, 
it, it, each side needs to have their own program and then they, they meet do. together meeting in the middle is, is where, where the healthy loving relationship forms. yeah and, and it's really weird because when you come back and meet in that place of health you don't talk about the past you don't talk about the future you stay pretty present focused and you say things like oh i feel a little weird like i feel like you feel really vulnerable. It's like your mask is off and you be you're you're in a relationship that you've never been in before. And you know, um, and it and it's it's it you feel awkward and you don't really know how to be and you start to learn together and you make a new journey and new experiences. And I gotta tell you, I don't think I ever, ever knew what love was until I got clean and sober. I can remember telling my parents that I love them I didn't feel it I can remember telling my children I love them and I felt something but not to the extent that I saw other people feel it um and when I got clean and sober like I had no idea you couldn't love others when you're empty inside like you can't when you're yeah. empty inside you don't have the ability to love others you certainly don't love yourself and if you don't have a healthy loving relationship with yourself you're not going to have it with others and now I can look at people and my heart gets warm and my eyes get watery and I don't have to say his word. And I just, I love that I can love this way um, without hurting, without owning, without controlling, but I can love. And so I think that's a huge gift from recovery is that, you know, we can love the people in our lives the way they always deserved and, and needed to be loved. Uh, there was, I'm trying, trying to locate, there was a couple great co comments. Uh, someone wanted you to elaborate on setting boundaries. Okay. So boundaries are the things that you need in your relationship to feel respected and safe. My boundaries are going to be different than yours. Uh, what's important to you in a relationship and it depends on the relationship you're in right my boundaries with my child are going to be different than my boundaries with my spouse um oh how do you explain that someone's 90 days sober and still emotionally and manipulates hang on donna and higgy if you can remind me of that so boundaries are what boundaries do you need in your life and then um so if i'm in a relationship uh with my partner i need a couple of things i need respect and honesty Okay. And I need that. And, um, and so if that's not going to happen, what am I prepared to do? And let's not go black or white here. We don't have to go all or go home. What am I prepared to do? Okay. So maybe if that, if I realize that, that my partner's not able to be honest with me, instead of hitting the door, what I can do is I can ask us to go to counseling together. If my partner's not willing to go to counseling together and my life is falling apart, maybe I need to go to counseling, okay? And then maybe through that counseling experience, I learn, what am I doing in a relationship where I'm not getting honesty and respect? Why, what is it? It's because it's not about him anymore. It's not about him, it's about me. It's about what is, what is it in me that I need to do to make myself think I'm worthy of love and respect, right? So, so there's lots of, lots of, so boundaries are really just what do you need to do to be safe in those relationships? What do you need from them? So they're not walls, they're bridges. Mm. That's, that's, a, that's great right there. That's great. Yeah, because so often we're like, oh, well, kick them to the curb. Well, no, let's not do that. That's an ad, that's an alcoholic family thinking. Those are addictive dynamics because addiction is black and white. And so what recovery does is it invites you into the middle ground. And you want to be in the area of balance and middle ground. And you need other people to do that, right? Donna's wondering why someone's still emotionally manipulating when they're 90 days clean and sober. Mm -hmm. um, and and Donna, I want to tell you this, 90 days clean and sober is baby days. Their brain is not healed. They are still in post acute withdrawal. It's all they can do not to pick up a day at a time. You're not going to see a lot of ch behavioral changes for a while yet. It's do a victory dance. They're 90 days clean and sober. Absolutely. So let's, yeah. let's, let's talk about the post acute withdrawal symptoms. That I, I struggled with that for like six months. Sometimes it takes a year, sometimes it takes two. So give yourself 
for, for every year you've been using, give yourself a month to three to have those post acute withdrawals and they start off severe. And I mean, obviously withdrawal is the body aches and the sweats and the diarrhea and the headaches and the vomiting and all of that. And that usually lasts a couple of weeks. And then we go into a post, post acute withdrawal phase and that, um, you know, that's where there's the brain fog, the mood swings, um, not feeling normal in my own skin, people pleasing, feeling overwhelmed all the time. You're still in your old behaviors, uh, you know, and it takes a long, long time to come out of that and for the brain to clear. And every person is really different with that too. And some of us struggle with mental health issues as well. So there's a lot going on besides, a lot more going on besides um, just removing the drugs and alcohol uh, from a life that to make it better. I mean, abstinence is the first step, but we got to keep peeling away families, families, families. I'm going to ask you to imagine a pair of scissors in your mind. Just see it. Close your eyes and see a pair of scissors and then see the addicted person and see yourself and see the tether in between. Take those scissors and cut it cut that tether really you cannot tie your emotional well-being to the addict in front of you you can't you need to make your quality of life and your emotional well-being your responsibility just as they need to do that themselves for themselves okay. so so really i i, I and i know uh, I got to tell you sometimes i feel like i might have big lumps on my head because i i i mean anyone that knows me um, knows I say this an awful lot, but it isn't the somebody, your quality of life doesn't rest on anyone else's shoulders, but your own. So if you're, if you're sick with worry, if you're filled with resentment, if you're miserable, if you're isolating, if you're crying into your pillow, if you're making yourself sick, if you can't stop thinking about the addict, if you're hiding from your friends, if you're living in shame, then your quality of life has been affected that is your responsibility to do something about it. Even if the addicted person gets well, it won't change what's happened to you. And even if they never get well, I promise you this, if you take your recovery into your hands, if you do what you need to do for you, it isn't, in, 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 no matter what the addict's doing, you're gonna live a great, happy life because you're not tied to them anymore. You don't suffer the lows and highs. You know what to do to look after yourself. And, and and I hope everybody watching this takes that away. Let me let me ask you a question. In in your opinion, do interventions work? Are they successful? Yes. 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 And I'll tell you why. Not everyone. Not every intervention works. If we did a hundred interventions, a hundred interventions aren't going to work. But more than fifty percent will. And here's the really difficult part because when we love addicts. We can't make them well. We can't we can't love them well. So there's a couple things you want to do before you say, "I'm gonna, I, I can't do any more for you, and I'm gonna let you go, and I'm gonna detach with love." What, what, and what are the, I'm sorry to interrupt you. What What are the three C's? I I didn't cause it. Cause it. I can't, can't cure it, and I something. Can't control it. Yeah. Can't control it. That's right. It. Yeah. 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 So, but, but. You know, um, you can certainly if see, here's the thing. 21 years ago, when I got clean and sober, fentanyl wasn't in the picture. And my thoughts have changed a lot because fentanyl is in the picture. And you know what? You don't even have to be an addict to die from overdose anymore. So as a parent, as a spouse, and if someone, God forbid, dies, you do want to have a sense that you've done everything you can, all that you know, so that you don't live with that guilt and so what does that look like well it looks like first of all you focusing on you making sure you're healthy and you're not reacting to their demands but you're coming to them in a place of health and with support so it looks like that it also looks like um you know what is this a case where we can do a casey's law or a jennifer act or can we do um because there's all sorts of acts across the US that, um, you know, will uh, impose mandatory treatment. Um, also, are we involving the rest of our family in this? Have we tried a family intervention? Have we tried coming together as a family to talk to this person? Uh, you know, have we done that? 
And then bottom line is if we see that person slipping away and we really are fearful, uh, maybe we call an interventionist, you know, or at least we call an interventionist to say, what should we do? We can't afford your services, but we desperately need your advice. And you're going to get it. You'll get it. And you can always um, private message me and I'll try and get you some links and help. I'm sure Hagee's going to help. But you want to know at the end of the day, you've done all you can. It's not going to it, it, it isn't a cure, but for your own well-being, you want to know you've done everything you can. So it starts with you. And um, and then it also means making some hard choices, right? Uh, it means um, not allowing yourself to be manipulated. It means saying no to enabling. Enabling kills just as many addicts as fentanyl does. So if we really want to identify a monster, that's it. Um, because families are doing it and they're not on drugs. They're not doing it to harm the addict. They're doing it because they're misinformed. They feel badly for the addict. They want to help. And, um, you know, and it's an easy fix. Uh, but it creates a lot more problems than it than it helps. So, yeah, the the the, the whole moral fabric of our country, uh, both of our countries, is being compromised. Yes, the, the, it the, is. The, the 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 tradition, the concept of family, is being decimated due to the addiction issues that are running rampant. You know, the uh, just. just we are losing so many people without, you know, and so, so many young people are dying without benefit of hitting a bottom. That's right. We, 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 we you're like, you're like me. We, we've been in this for a while and the old school people will say, you can't help somebody till they hit their bottom. Is that true? No, no. What we want to do is raise the bottom because today bottom is death. You know, there is some great, there's Suboxone, there's Methadone, there's uh, medical assisted therapy and treatment. If you've been on heroin a long time, you know what, you're going to need some help. Um, that's a extremely high relapse risk. Um, so there's all sorts of ways to get clean and sober. And I don't think we need to be judging anyone how they work their program of recovery, as long as they're taking steps to get well. And, um, you know, and here's the thing, though. Um, it, 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 no, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Uh, we all need help. And so isolation promotes addiction and uh, connection re re promotes recovery. And there's, there is, and, and it's, 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 I know we, we think this thing looks hopeless. But I need you to know there's more people in recovery than are struggling with addiction right now. So what can you do? You can start talking to your neighbor about it. You can start sharing posts. You can go to seminars. You can tell people. You can share your story. You can stop hiding as if addiction is a shameful thing. The things that addicts do to get their drugs is a shameful thing. That That's what creates the stigma. But addiction in itself isn't, isn't a shame, just like cancer isn't. It's a disease. And if you don't believe that, you'll continue to try and fix and control it. Absolutely, absolutely. So how did you find, let, let's switch gears here. How, how, did, how did you find out you had a knack for writing? How, how, how did you find out you had that ability that you could convey something through your writing to have such, and I'm sure you didn't know this, you're coming in that I, your, I word, your words were going to impact so many hundreds of thousands of people and families. How did, how did you stumble upon this ability? Funny story. Got clean okay. and sober? <laughs> no, it was, it was, well, yes, yes, that had to happen in order for this to happen. But, um, I wrote a poem. I had been on a three day meth binge and I was going crazy in my mind. And I wrote a poem in the middle of this meth binge and I sent it to my girlfriend. And when I got clean and when I sobered up and when I came crashing down and when I realized I sent her this poem, I was horrified because, oh my God, my poems were the place that I put my truth in. I let my dark monster out onto paper and then I usually shredded it, burned it and never let anyone see it. And in my high state, I sent it to my girlfriend and I was like mortified. I hid from her for years. I never wanted to see her again. Anyways, I got fast forward. I got clean and sober and she sent me that poem and she said, I've taken this to schools and people cry. You have no idea the power of your words. And so that was the very first time I started to think I've, I've always loved to read. Um, as a little child, I used to read to escape my insane family. Uh, I certainly never had a clue uh, that I would be writing. 
And um, so one day, and I, you know, and here's the thing about books. If any of you guys watching ever want to write your story or you, you're you interested in writing, I always thought to write a book, you had to know what it looked like. You needed to know its title. You needed to know what would go on the pages. You needed to have an idea of a beginning, middle, and end. And I just, I couldn't imagine even ever doing that. So one day I sat down at the computer and I started to write and it became a sentence, which became a paragraph, which became a page. And that started to write me. And that's how it happened. Um, I didn't know what the book was called. I didn't know it would be a book. I thought it was a thought. I thought it was just me with a thought. Um, and then that thing started to write me. It would wake me up at three in the morning and tell me to come down to my computer and start writing. And all of a sudden, these people took on lives and they were people in treatment and addicts on the street. And they were families like you and me. And um, they all had voices and they all needed to be heard. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm writing a book. Like, isn't that insane? And I told people and I sent them chapters and they were like, oh, my God, did you write any more? I need to read this. I can't put this down. And um, and so halfway through the book, I thought, I can't put this all in a book because what I realized is we can't write a story about addiction without talk, without bringing the family in. We can't write a story about addiction without bringing recovery in. We can't write a story about addiction without bringing this whole thing in. And so one book became two. And so I brought the family. I brought the family in. The, the the first book, Jagged Jagged Little Edges. What was the premise for that? Your your life? Yeah, I I uh, I really my parents are alive. Uh, I want to be respectful. I work in a position of working with many people. I want to be respectful, but there isn't anything in these books that didn't happen. They are highly influenced by my life experience. Anyone reading them that knows me knows who what's happening in those books yes yeah, so i could have not called them call i could have called them a memoir uh but i wanted to be respectful of the people involved in my life today um because we're in a different spot and this is why i wrote the third book in this series because i want to show clearly what happens jagged no more right i want to show clearly what happens um well when you i mean we all have these broken places uh, particularly if you're addicted or you love someone who is, but when you can shine a light into those broken places, I really wanted to show what happens not only to the addict, but to the family. And, um, and so I wanted to leave readers with the entire spectrum and with some hope. And there isn't anyone that reads these that doesn't say I saw my family all over that book, all over those pages. Thank you, and um, and you know they're kind of entertaining too. So uh, it, I, I think your I think your readers will like them. Uh, we, we we the 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 link is will be posted in the comments as well. I uh, we we have the the links to to her pages where you can order the books on the crawler on the screen. Uh, you you can you can go to www.jaggedlittleedges.com forward slash books by Laura Lee Rosano forward I, I just I Go just ahead. want to show my kids one because um, this is Gracie's secret and I am the child of an alcoholic and if you have kids I mean you guys if you can't afford books Go to your library and ask the librarian to order them in read this book with your kids if they've been affected by somebody's addiction in this book this little girl f learns to find her voice. And there's a little workbook section in the back of this book that you can do with your kids so you understand where they're at and where they're coming from. Because children, because please God, let's break this cycle. Because kids that have the ability to talk about their emotions do not grow up and act on them. So um, that's a pretty special little book. So check it out, go to the library. Um, there's other ways you can get it, um, but most of the libraries are ordering them in. If you if they don't have them, ask your librarian to order them in. Uh, Catherine, Catherine Townsend Lyons, she is also an author in the comments. She said she had to come on and say a big hello and love you, Laura Lee, a fellow author and dear friend. Hugs girl. Cat. 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 Yeah. Oh my God. Hello. And there's Lori Palmer on your site and a million others. Uh, I have found so many awesome 
friends uh, through um, just doing what I'm doing, just sharing my story and and tips with uh, the addicted persons and their families, just as you have. I love the real courageous people we meet each and every day on our pages. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, plug, plug your pages, your blog. Where can people find you? Where can they follow you? They can find me at uh, Laura Lee Rosano on Facebook. And I think you've got the crawler with my name. And um, they can also find me on Instagram, on Twitter, although I don't tweet a whole lot. Uh, they can also find me at jaggedlittleedges.com on my blog. But really, I do have uh, a group for families too, um, a recovering codependency group through Laura Lee Rosanna. We've got a couple thousand members that are just amazing really willing to do the work uh, but mostly on my Facebook page just private message me or um, if you have a question or start reading the page and uh, find me there almost most days that's amazing um, you have a phenomenal following of, of, of family members and and addicts addicts in recovery people you 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 touch people's lives on a daily basis I, I I read your posts I see I see your your memes your your quotes it's all about giving hope and inspiration education and awareness and that's what we're that's what we're here for you know yeah. and uh, I really really truly feel blessed that you you we finally were able to link up I, th I think we did we, it. I think we we've, we've, we've made an impact and I, I think that you You've uh, given some some really good advice for the families and, and for other people. You know, did, it, it helps to see different perspectives and the sides and how how we affected other people. You know, the people we love and and what we've done to them and how how we can help them heal by doing the right thing too. You know, uh, absolutely. And to the addict who's watching, and I know you are, to the addict who's watching, sitting there wondering where their next hit is i want Thank you to you know can. i want you to know you are not a loser you are not a junkie you you're are not alone you're not alone you are absolutely deserving of love health and healing and please stop yes. listening to your head because it's lying to you every single second your addiction lives in what you tell yourself and how you feel about yourself you are lovable worthy and we need you in this fight so come on over um there's just no shame in getting well and we'll help you do it you don't we'll help you do it that's right so be, be, before i close you know that's the way i close all of my shows so thank you for you know, we're on that we're on the same wavelength we have the same mission and goals before we go will you come back on <laughs> maybe yeah of course i'll come back on I'll, I'll, I'll let your i'll let your viewers tell me if i should come back on if you guys want me to come back on leave a comment and then i'd be glad to come back on and then maybe you know you can come over to my page and and uh yeah we can we can do this and 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 yeah and the other people with the comments you know you guys are you guys are equally as important too. we need you in this fight we need your feedback we need your story we need your strength we need you. We are stronger together, and we can't do this without you. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Stand up, speak out, tell your story. Yeah, breathe, yeah. Breathe, breathe life into somebody else's world today. You know. Oh, I love that analogy. Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let, let 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 people know that they're not alone. You know, it's, addiction is about separation. Recovery is about connection, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, I think you. It, it, we're we're moving into a position where we can't be hiding anymore. It's time to take off the mask. It's okay to tell people that you got addiction in the family and what you're doing about that because one in seven people have a, are addicted. That's one in seven. So you can imagine the entire family members around that. Everybody's struggling with it now. So your story is absolutely going to be the life someone else needs it's, it's, and it's, maybe it's, even saves. It's yeah. important, you know. The, the lie is dead. We do recover no matter what if we really want it, and we and we yeah. seek out yeah. seek out people with knowledge and the positive support network, and 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 find a program that fits your needs and, and helps you grow and get your life back yeah. on track. You know, if it, if Matt is going to be a part of it, please do that because it's impossible to recover when you're dead, yeah. and we want we yeah. want and so, we need you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's a good stepping stone. I'm not suggesting you have to live your whole recovery on it, you know, but it's a great no. stepping stone. And at least it's, it, you know, it's a good first step. Um, and I just want to say, sometimes we recover even when we don't want to. So for families, get active, get involved, um, learn all you can and uh, make sure, you know, you're you're getting help for you, too. Okay, we're, there's a crawler one more time. JaggedLittleEdges.com. <laughs> Books by Laura Lee Rosano. Thank you, Laura Lee. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for Thank being here. Thank you for here. having me. Thank you, everyone. Please Thank continue you. to keep share, sharing this video. Somebody out there needs to hear what we talked about. People are, people are yeah. dying yeah. and dying and dying, and it's, it's not showing no signs of stopping anytime soon. And like Laura Lee said, you're deserving of love to give it, to feel it, and receive it. So please know that. And thank you. Yeah. We're going to peace out, guys. Love y'all. Stay on here with me, Laura Lee, for a second. Okay.